hello to everybody and welcome. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to uh, the webinar in which we're going to give an update of the latest research findings from two national studies uh, with acronyms CLOCK and SKIDS. So they're two different research studies and we, we just really want to communicate and let people know what we're finding. My name is Professor Roy Chaperin. I'm a clinical psychologist and professor of translational psychology at the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. And I work um, with uh, Professor Sir Terence Stevenson on the CLOCK study. So just a, a quick sort of information about today, because it's a, a Zoom webinar rather than a meeting, so it's slightly different. You won't be able to type in the chat, but you will be able to ask a question in the Q&A. So if you've got questions, that would be great. Really happy to try and answer them. But it is a research update. So if you've got particular personal questions um, relating to yourself or a loved one, then we, we may not be able to answer those, but we will certainly um, be able to answer questions about the research studies and what they're finding. We're going to... Um, start off uh, with Professor Sir Terence Stevenson, who is going to let us know about the CLOCK study. Thanks, Roz, and hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is going to be a very quick overview of the CLOCK study, the largest study in the world of uh, long COVID in children, young people. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and show you some slides, and then we're going to have some time for question and answers. And, uh, uh, I hope you find this interesting and I, and I look forward to hearing your questions. So here we go. So the CLOCK project is a project running, a research project running in England. It's uh, funded by the National Institute of Health Research. It has a lot of people on it, Roz and I and Shemez and Emma and Snehal are here today, but actually it's got a lot of people. And the reason I want to say that is to say thank you to them, but also to reassure all of you that we've got representation from all over England, uh, the north of England, the Midlands, the southwest, and indeed one of our collaborators is from Scotland. So this is truly a national piece of work. Well, why did we apply for the funding to, to do the CLOCK study? You probably all know that for children generally, uh, a COVID has been quite a mild acute illness relatively small numbers of deaths. The picture on the right shows for men and women down to boys and girls. The purple bars are those who died. The yellow were those in hospital at the time this figure was made and pink was those who'd been in hospital and sent home. And you can see that once you get down to below 20 years old, it, the numbers are really, really tiny. So that's been good news for children and young people. But many children and young people have had the infection, as you will see, and initially, when the vaccine was rolled out, it was initially rolled out for adults, so children remain vulnerable to getting the COVID infection with SARS-CoV-2 virus. And gradually, uh, when we applied to do this at the end of 2020, people were starting to become concerned about long COVID in adults, persisting symptoms and persisting illness that didn't get better when, when they uh, got rid of the virus. And there was a concern about maybe that was happening in children, and so nobody knew. Nobody knew. It was important we researched it. So, a lot of children were being infected. Uh, over the seven-month period that we've been looking at, September 2020 to the end of March 2021, about a quarter of a million uh, people, teenagers aged 11 to 17, tested positive for COVID-19 across England. And another one and a quarter million had a test to see if they got the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the COVID virus, and they tested negative. So our study was looking at, could we compare those who tested positive and see whether they had more long-term effects compared to children who'd never had the virus? And how are we answering that question? Well, most importantly, we didn't ask young people if they got long COVID, because at that stage, nobody could agree on what that was. We just simply asked young people to tell us using an online questionnaire about their physical health, their bodily health, and their mental health. And we were able to do that because we collaborated with a body then called Public Health England, now called the UK Health Security Agency, which uh, had a record of everybody in England who'd ever had a PCR test and it had their name and their date of birth and their address. So that allowed us to contact a group of young people and that's how we did the study. What we did was we've actually got 
30,000 young people in our study, teenagers, half of them have tested positive and half have tested negative. And they're from all over England. They're roughly half male, half female. We've got more BME young people in it than, than is true for England in general. So we've done really well there. And in particular, the body that funded the research wanted us to look at children who hadn't been in hospital. As I've said, very few children admitted to hospital. It wasn't a very severe acute illness for children. They were interested in young people who had not been very unwell with the virus, but what happened to them long term. And what do we mean by matched? What we mean is that the positives and negatives are, are if you will, comparable or similar. They're, they're for each, if, if you had a, a, a 14 year old a BME girl from Blackburn in the study who tested positive, ideally we've got a 14 year old BME girl from Blackburn who tested negative. That's what we mean by match. So we're trying to make the two groups as similar as possible. Okay, very briefly, only one little bit of results because there just isn't time and I don't want to bore you with this, but what about the symptoms at the time of test? I've said on the whole, acute COVID has been mild for children and our study uh, reflected that. Only about a third of young people who tested positive had any symptoms at all. So two thirds are what we as doctors call completely asymptomatic. I'm a children's doctor working in London and two thirds of the young people who definitely had the virus didn't have any symptoms. Uh, of those who did have symptoms, they had headache, tiredness, sore throat, and this funny one, loss of smell or taste that we don't see with other viruses, but is very particular for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And of course, those who tested negative, they still did have some problems because these were the months of September through to um, um, uh, December uh, 2020, when um, uh, other viruses are going around, people are unwell. So they had the typical problems that young people have during winter months, sore throat, headache, cough, and temperature. But not many of them, only one in 10. What about three months later? And three months at that time was what people said that that, that what we'll call long COVID. If you've still got problems three months after your positive test, we'll call that long COVID. So you can see that the light blue bars are those who tested positive and the dark blue bars are the percentages in those who tested negative. And there was a big overlap, perhaps more surprising than we expected. But these symptoms, tiredness, shortness of breath, headache, loss of smell and dizziness were all commoner in those who had tested positive for the virus than those who tested negative. Now, if you think the rates are quite high in the negatives who'd never had SARS-CoV-2, quarter of them having tiredness, one in 10 short of breath, uh, one in seven having headache, you might think, gosh, but how can they have that many? Well, we have two studies from before the pandemic, which suggest that on any one day, quite a lot of teenagers do have symptoms. One study from 2007 said that a third of 11 to 15 year olds would have felt fatigue or tiredness, unusual tiredness over a four to six month period. And, and, and another study, and these are big studies involving thousands of teenagers, one in five of teenagers reported at least having either headache, fatigue or asthma on any one day. So I think those dark blue bars probably are, are consistent with what teenagers experience during winter months, but the light blue bars are higher. Well, what does that all mean? Well, I told you that a quarter of a million young people, teenagers tested positive between September 20 and March 21. About one in eight of those who we approached responded to our survey. And if those respondents are typical of all the teenagers who tested positive, then across England, about 70,000 teenagers would still have three or more physical problems three months later. And I've shown you that the, even those who test negative have some problems. So if we subtract one from the other, we can work out how much of this problem is due to the virus itself. And what we would say is that about 32,000 children, about one in seven of the quarter of a million who tested positive would have three or more physical symptoms, <clears throat> not due to living through a pandemic, not due to some other virus, but due to having had the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So not a trivial problem, 32,000 uh, young people that's just September 2020 to March 21, 32,000 11, 17 year olds who might have at least three symptoms still uh, three months after their positive test. This I've said is the biggest study we know of in the world. 
We know that the young people who were positive were positive because we used the lab test called the PCR test. Some other research used people just to self-report that they'd had COVID. We asked young people about their problems. We didn't use some undefined, have you had long COVID? We have had this comparison group. We've got 15,000 teenagers who've lived through the pandemic, but not had the virus. And as I've said, we've drawn young people from across the whole of England, from every ethnicity, from both sexes and all the ages 11 to 17. So I want to say thank you to those of you on this webinar for your interest and support, and those who will watch this subsequently. Um, I want to say thank you to all of our 30,000 participants for your help so far. And please stay with us. This final slide shows that I've been describing young people recruited between uh, September 2020 and March 21. A lot of people thought then that the uh, pandemic was over, but in fact, you will know that we had another uh, rose again, and particularly over December and January 2021 and December 20, uh, January 2022 and December 2021, there was another huge peak due to something called the Omicron variant. And we've recruited another a thousand young people to look at whether that Omicron is different from the young people we looked at earlier. So I'm going to stop there, stop sharing. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Roz. Thank you very much, Terence. Really interesting and important. And I guess while people are just typing their questions in the, in the Q&A, maybe I could ask you one of the most common questions, which is why do you need this control group? Yeah, that's been very important. We're really glad we did that. If you just studied young people who had had the SARS-CoV-2 virus, then you would conclude that, I don't know, um, lots of them had problems um, three months later. But actually, a lot of the children who'd never had the virus had problems three months later. They'd lived through a pandemic. They'd perhaps seen their grandparents die. They'd had school closure. They'd been unable to meet their friends. They'd been forced to study at home. So. Uh, not surprisingly, anyone who's lived through a pandemic or a tsunami or the young people in Ukraine at the moment, they will experience a lot of symptoms, headache, tiredness, feeling funny, feeling faint, feeling dizzy because of what they've lived through. And our control group allowed us to say how much of these problems are due to living through a pandemic. And then our positive group allowed us to say over and above that, this is the risk of having problems due to the virus. So having a control group it's become clear as absolutely essential to understanding long COVID in young people. But how do you know that the control group of negatives are really negative? So fortunately, our collaboration with uh, Shamez Ladani and the team at Public Health England, UK Health Security Agency, because they track all the tests, we know that these people have always been negative. Now, of course, it's possible they've had the virus and didn't have a test. And right now, if you were starting doing this research now, as testing's been reduced, that would be really difficult. But at the time we were, we, we recruited our 30,000 young people, uh, testing was widely available. It was free. Uh, the, England was one of the countries that, that really did very well in, in the amount of testing it rolled out um, by the time we were doing our research. And so we're confident that at the, uh, certainly at the time we, these young people joined our study, they were definitely negatives. Thank you. It's a question from Heidi asking, what were your findings on the mental health front? Really good question. So we were, I think, pleasantly surprised. I haven't had time to show you that today, but we asked young people, we, there are three or four different tools you can use to ask young people to describe their well-being and mental health. And reassuringly, we found that the mental health of the people who tested positive three months after their test was it really no worse than those who tested negative? And indeed, when we compare it to young people, teenagers, long before the pandemic, the scores aren't that different from young people before the pandemic. Now, a lot of young people, uh, as with adults, uh, expressed worry. And of course, they're worried, worried about would their school reopen, worried about would, would their grandparents survive? But worry or anxiety is a different thing. If you're actually asking about their mental health and well-being, then it was very similar to teenagers before the pandemic. So um, slightly perhaps surprising, but also very gratifying and reassuring. Good news for young people. Thank you. And if I've got COVID or one of my loved ones have COVID, is there any way of knowing if I'm gonna get long COVID? 
Um, there's no way of knowing for sure. Um, we have developed, uh, there's, there are various definitions of long COVID in adults. There's no widely accepted definition in children. We've been working with the World Health Organization because we have come up with a research definition. But until that's uh, adopted, let's just say, what's the chance of having persisting symptoms, physical problems like headache and breathlessness and, and cough um, three, six months later? Um, it looks like the risk is greater in girls and boys. It looks like the risk is greater in older teenagers than younger teenagers. And, and the audience might be wondering, why did we only study teenagers? Well, our experience of other uh, illnesses following viruses is that it's mostly teenagers rather than primary school children. And you're probably more at risk if you've got physical or mental health problems before the pandemic started. Uh, if you were in perfectly good health, you're probably at slightly less risk. But I want to emphasize that in my answering all these questions, I'm talking about averages. Um, for any one individual, it's very hard to predict for, for a single person. And I'm certainly not saying the majority of young people who have persisting symptoms didn't have mental health problems, but it does place you more at risk. Thank you. I don't know if Dr. Pinto Piero wants to also comment on that. Um, yeah. Ooh. Sorry. Yes. Hi. Um, yes. Just to build on what Terence said, I echo exactly what he said. Um, and we have also built a model to try and predict the child who might go on to develop persisting symptoms at three months. Um, Roz, would you also like me to answer the question that's currently there? Yeah, that, that would be good. And maybe um, you might want to just tell people who you are. I'm sorry, I didn't oh, say who sorry. you are. Yes, of course, no problem. So I'm um, Snehal Pinto Pereira. I'm a lecturer in population health and applied statistics in um, UCL. And I work on the long COVID study that um, Dr. Uh, Professor Terence Stevenson described. Um, so yes, Oliver asked a very good question. Um, he commented on the fact that one in eight people, one, one in eight of those invited took part. And basically, I think the question is around whether there's systematic differences between the type of person who takes part and the type of person who doesn't. And that's a really good and a very important question. And in response to that, yes, we were concerned about that. And so we did look at the type of person who took part and the type of person who didn't and compared them in terms of age um, <clears throat> region from which they were, um, whether they tested positive or negative and so forth. And all what we did was we weighted our, our analysis. So we used the people who took part and weighted them to be representative of the target population. So essentially, just hypothetically speaking, just in, norm in surveys, girls tend to take part more than boys. So what we did was, we kind of weighted down the population of girls in our study and weighted up slightly the population of boys to equal the target population who we invited to take part. I hope that answers your question, Oliver, and it wasn't too confusing. And the, the second part was about the matching, ensuring that the control and the code exposed group were the same and uh, quite a lot of effort was made to make sure that they were, they were matched, um, including in, the, in terms of the month of the, of the test. So they were closely matched. People joining this at five o'clock might have uh, might want a sneak preview as to what's coming next. So uh, could you just give a hint as to the people perhaps at three months who had symptoms, what was it like at six months? Did they have the same number of symptoms, more, less? Does it get better? Could you give a sneak? Yeah, I can give a sneak. It's not out yet, but um, good news is that for many of the young people who have symptoms at three months, they're getting better by six months. So fewer have Fewer of the young people who had symptoms at three months have them at six months. So that's, and that fits with what we know with other, uh, with teenagers who have other viruses, like, like glandular fever is a very good example where we would expect them gradually to get better over time. So that's a good news story. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, I think that's it for um, clock. Um, there's a, another question in the chat that maybe we can, in the Q&A, we can maybe come back to at the end if we have time. But we're going to now pass over to hear about the SCID study from Dr. Shemez Ladani. Hi, Ross. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, 
you know, one of the reasons that CLOCK came about is because we started doing so much work with children early in the pandemic and uh, trying to understand infections um, and transmission in children because uh, a lot of attention was focused on um, on the, eld uh, on the elderly and, and adults with underlying conditions at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh, people were not generally concerned about children, except that uh, they needed to uh, be isolated so that they are not taking part in infection and transmission in the community, just like flu was. And a lot of the early experiences were all based on influenza and the pandemic um, we had in the past and modeling work and preparedness for influenza rather than uh, coronavirus. And so much of our uh, experience at the time was uh, based on another virus. Um, and it didn't necessarily mean that they would be working in the same way. And many of you will remember going right the way back to January and February, 2020, that's nearly two and a half years ago. Uh, there were uh, several reports from China saying that children account for very small numbers of cases uh, of COVID and very few hospitalizations. And in fact, the, uh, the common dogma at the time was that children were only responsible for 1% of cases confirmed in China. And to be honest, when we reported our first analysis in England, uh, looking at the first couple of months, um, what we could see very clearly is that uh, children indeed uh, had a very low risk of infection. So the first graph over there on the uh, left hand side shows the proportion who tested positive by age group starting under three months old. And the green bars are children and then the blue bars are adults. You can see that the positivity rate of this infection was very, very low in children compared to the adults. We were also able to uh, show up mortality rates and in fact there was a reduction in uh, childhood mortality rather than an increase which gave us some reassurance that one the infection rates in children which more, was much lower than adults and second they weren't we weren't missing infections that were resulting in terrible outcomes in children and and that was quite um uh, reassuring at the time. But one of the first things that the UK, like many other countries, did is they closed down schools uh, because they were concerned that there would be a lot of transmission in children and in schools, which would then be uh, transferred back to the homes in the community and will perpetuate the outbreak. Um, but we as pediatricians on the field uh, were very clear from the beginning that school closures are likely to cause a lot of harm uh, to children uh, from uh, multiple reasons. It wasn't just about their education development, it was about their emotional and social development, the physical activities, the school meals, the, uh, the, what the, you know, they have access to social services and social media at the time. And it was very difficult uh, for them to uh, have access to their school vaccinations and school meals um, were also wouldn't be available to them. And we were very keen to try and get children back to school, but we wanted to make sure that it was done in a very safe environment. And children didn't go to school mostly in, in March, April and May. Um, mostly the healthcare workers' children were in school. The rest of them were at home because the schools were generally closed. But when they reopened in June, some school years went back to, to school. And that was an excellent opportunity for us to go in and understand how this virus moves around, who might have the virus, how it's transmitted, and who might be at risk so that we can make sure that if children do come back to school, they are adequately uh, protected from infection themselves and infecting others. And the SCID study began in early June where we initially only wanted around five schools to see how the virus was transmitting, but there was a real push to try and get as many schools as we could really, really quickly. And in a matter of about two weeks, we went from five schools to 138 schools across England. And we divided the schools into two parts. One of them had regular weekly swabs taken for the virus. And then the other one had a blood test taken along with the virus because we wanted to look at antibodies. And the reason we wanted to do that is that we know antibodies mean that you've been exposed to the virus and it doesn't matter whether it was 
uh, whether you had symptoms or didn't have symptoms, there were a pure test of exposure to the virus. We ended up recruiting more than 12,000 students and we sent teams into each of these schools to take swabs from children uh, in school, uh, usually in the assembly hall or in the sports hall. And the swabs were then brought back to our reference laboratory in London and tested in bulk. And of the 12,000 participants, um, we had on average about 93 of them in 86 schools that were doing the weekly swabbing. And then we had about 43 participants in 45 schools that gave us a blood sample for antibody testing. And around 60% were students, about 40% were staff. We took 43,000 swabs in six weeks. And of those swabs, only one student and five staff members had the virus. And that is throughout the six weeks, which told us that when we were in lockdown and there was very little community transmission at the time, the risk of children and staff coming to school and having the virus was extremely low. And you can see the numbers uh, at the end of this slide of 3.9 per 100,000 children per, per week and 11 per 100,000 staff per week. Um, but one of the other things that we wanted to do, like I said, is an antibody test. And the only way to do that really was to take blood samples from children. And it was incredible the number of brave primary school children whose families agreed to take part, um, sometimes without their parents and just with their teachers. And we had loads of kids in different schools coming to, uh, to have their blood test taken. And I have a picture of one of the brave girls here. And you can see that it was done by very specialist doctors and nurses. Uh, we put magic cream in their hands. Uh, there was a teacher or the mother standing next to the child and the whole thing was done within a couple of minutes and then they were done. But the amount of information that we collected was incredibly powerful because it told us something that we always believed that uh, children were just as likely to get infected. There was nothing magical about children that protected them from getting the infection. Uh, and um, just like adults, they can get infected and wouldn't be surprising if they could infect other people if they got the virus. So they were going to be uh, important in transmission. The question is, we had no context of how important they were compared to adults, young adults and the elderly. But this is one really nice graph that I like from the United States, which gave us an idea about what was happening. So early in the pandemic, on the left hand side of the slide, you can see that children were uh, responsible for only 2.6% of cases that were being tested in America uh, back in um, uh, February, March and April uh, of, of the pandemic in 2020. But within a uh, six months or so, when the tests became readily available and anybody could be tested, around a quarter of all the cases were in children. And in the United States, children account for about a quarter of the population. And the reason that we had such low rates in the beginning is children had very mild transient infections, so they were completely asymptomatic. And so they were never tested for the virus, so we never found it. So we just assume it's all in the adults. But this shows very nicely that children do get infected and it's very likely that they could transmit it to others. And that's important because if you're going to set up any measures to try and stop transmission, you have to understand the risks first. And you know, over the course of the last year and a half, we've seen a, a lot of uh, movement in terms of sometimes the children are the main trans uh, main. Uh, have the highest rates of infection, sometimes it's the adults. The only thing I would point out is that you have to take that in the context at the time. So for example, in the uh, full reopening of schools in September, we saw very clearly that uh, most of the increase in the beginning was in young adults, and that followed in young children even before the school started, and that trend continued. Uh, but then when in December and January, the adults were all in lockdown because of the alpha wave, children were still going to school and had a lot of social contacts outside the house and children became important. And then later in the pandemic, again, uh, when the adults were vaccinated, a lot of the infections was in children because they had been unvaccinated at the time. So you can use different parts of this graph to try and make a point that it's all about children or it's not about the children. So anybody who uses these graphs really you need to have an understanding of when these were taken. Uh, and one of the nicest bits of the pandemic that I think gives you a really good indication of what's happening 
is in March 2021, last year, when the Delta variant kicked in. Children went back to school uh, and they were there for six weeks and infection rates were very, very low in all the students and the staff, even with the students testing uh, twice a week with the lateral flow tests. But as soon as uh, the country opened up in May and uh, everybody came out of lockdown, cases went up everywhere in children, adults, older adults. And that's because children are part of the community. And if, if community opens up, then children will have more opportunities for meeting and socially mixing with others, including adults, and infection rates will follow what's happening in the community. But one of the interesting things that we did with the antibody testing is that we tested regularly. So in, in primary school children, for example, we found that between June and July, only 1% of them who were negative became positive with antibodies, suggesting that only 1% of the students got infection between June and July. Uh, and in staff, it was even less. It was one staff member who got infected between June and July. And even when we opened up the schools completely, um, when we tested their blood sample in December, so having had three months of full reopening of schools, only 5% of those who didn't have any antibodies became positive. Um, and in adults, it was, some, it was a similar proportion in the teachers. And 5% and may sound a lot, but that's actually probably around the same amount of positivity rate in the community at the time. And there were loads of cases happening, yet one in 20 children got infected. The other 19 out of 20 didn't get infected, suggesting that if schools were really the hub of infection, you would expect much higher rates. And, we moved on from the SKID studies to the SKIDS plus studies, which are the uh, secondary school students. And again, at that time, between September and December, it was six and a half percent and nine percent. Again, not what you'd expect to see if schools were hubs of infection. But we've done a lot of work since then. The blood tests that the children gave us gave us so much information to help us understand the immunity in children. We found that children made very strong antibody responses, even if they had asymptomatic infection. Uh, we found that they developed very strong cellular responses. So their T cells and B cells were even better than adults. And when you compare them to the teachers, they had two and a half times uh, more cellular immunity compared to the teachers. And they lasted for at least six months, which explained why they could be protected for a long time. And until the Omicron variant came in, they actually had better protection against the variant compared to the adults when we did these studies in the laboratory. So one of the things that came out of, again, the SKID studies, which was incredible, is that we developed an antibody test using saliva by using a lollipop stick that you just rub in your mouth and then you can test for antibodies in there. And that went on to develop this, the school infection survey, which recruited 150 schools across the country. And after that, we were able to look at antibodies in the staff and it gave a little bit of reassurance that the antibody positivity in the staff at the time was very similar to the community. So even though the schools were open for um, all students, the risk of infection in school remained very low at the time. Um, in 2022, we have moved to the CIS-2 studies, which some of you may be taking part in, and that is now a nationally representative population of children. And we're able to test, we are able to estimate antibody positivity in children in all the different regions across the country. And this is just one of the results that was taken from November to December, and you can see how nicely the antibody positivity rate changes with age from four years to 16 years. So just to finish my talk, um, I think that most of us will agree that school closures have, have, have a much wider impact on children than just loss of education. And it's really important for the children to stay in school. The only way to understand infection and transmission is by performing studies in schools. We can't be doing with modeling and community testing to understand what's happening inside schools. And it was only through the uh, willingness of the schools and the teachers and the staff and the students that we were able to do so many studies in schools, which has helped us understand really important bits about, the, uh, about infection and transmission. And we couldn't have done it without their participation. And we have learned some really important lessons. We, 
we, we were able to show that children are not magical unicorns who don't get infected or transmit to others. We've shown that children actually have an incredible immune system uh, that can handle the virus, which helps protect them against reinfections and variants and getting very sick. And at the time when there were appropriate mitigations, uh, the in-school transmission rates remain very, very low. And uh, uh, the later data also show that actually vaccinating teachers and adult household members was key to make sure that children could attend the school safely because they were protected through vaccination. This is a whole group of people who've been working behind the scenes to get the data that I've just shown you. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. especially joining us from a conference abroad. So we are very grateful. Uh, just one uh, quick question, if it's okay. Um, from Isabel, we know that viruses can have long-term physical and mental health effects on young people, for example, glandular fever. Do we think that the COVID virus may have a worse long-term effect than these other viruses? It's, look, that's a very good question and I cannot see into the future. What I can see is what we're seeing on the ground. And what we see on the ground is that the vast majority of children who get the virus get it like a typical common cold and they recover within a few days. That is the typical course of illness with this virus, which is nothing like the viruses that cause um, glandular fever and chronic fatigue and so on. But saying that some children take longer to get better than others, and sometimes it can take a few weeks. When people talk about long COVID, unfortunately, the definition includes anything that could be around for after the infection, which makes it difficult to understand exactly what is happening. So within that syndrome, for example, we do have the loss of taste and smell, which takes weeks and sometimes a few months to get better, but it does get better in the vast majority of children. So there's a small group that actually takes longer to get better than you would expect. And that's because it's a new virus. The body didn't have an immune, any immunity against this virus and it takes a while to recover. There is a tiny percentage and we still need to do better studies to find those children who have long-term persistent symptoms. They, it does happen, all viruses do that. Influenza does it, Epstein-Barr virus does it, other viruses do it. And uh, it's an unfortunate outcome of uh, of viral illnesses when some children are unable to deal with the virus. And that group really is a group that we are trying really hard to identify so we can provide them with the support that they need in all aspects of support. Um, so at the moment, the vast majority of children do get better. Uh, a few actually take longer than you would like them to. And all the work we're doing is to try and identify those kids so we can better understand what these long COVID syndromes are. Thank you. And then the final question, because we'll then move on um, from David. As most children will have been infected, is there any point in now immunizing five to 11 year olds? It's a, it's, it's, it's a brilliant question and it puts me in a very awkward position because uh, there is a vaccine. But look, the JCVI is a UK uh, immunization scientific committee. And what they have said is that the vast majority of children aged 5 to 11 have been vaccinated, have been infected. And we think it's more than 90%, by the way. Um, the JCVI has offered the vaccine to parents because there are a lot of parents who remain concerned about the children. And if they want to get vaccinated, that's a really good thing. And that way they would feel reassured that the child is vaccinated, even if they've been infected. Um, the argument for vaccinating or the suggestion from the JCVA is it is possible that we may get a future variant that might be more severe than now. We don't know that you can't get that. Um, then if your child is vaccinated, then they might be protected against those variants. And that is a reason to allow the vaccination to occur. Uh, but at the same time, if your child has had COVID and the COVID was not severe, Everything that we know about viruses and immunities would suggest that um, you know, having some immunities of the virus will protect you if you get exposed to the virus again. So you wouldn't expect your second or third infection to be worse than your first one. Uh, but the vaccine is available and it is there. And if parents decide to take it, then it's there and they should take it. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. I'm now going to um, move on to 
Emma Dalrymple. And Emma is our patient public involvement lead. So she's been working really hard to make sure that children and young people uh, voices and input really shapes some of the research studies. So welcome, Emma. Hello. Um, so, I mean, we're not going to have slides. You and I are just going to have a chat um, about things, but maybe you can explain a bit better than me. Actually, what is PPI? PPI is, has been shortened to PPI because what it stands for is patient and public involvement, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and what that basically means is that patients, or in fact, anyone who is affected by study um, and members of the public should be involved in any medical and social care research projects. And there's an organization called the National Institute for Health and Care Research, um, and they've created guidance for good quality PPI and what that should look like. Um, and they define it as research being carried out with or by members of the public rather than it being done to them or about them or for them and I think it now nowadays it's very common practice if not almost certain that for funding organizations to grant money for research they expect that PPI is going to be part of that project right from the very beginning up until the end when the results of the study is shared um, and so some examples of what that might be it would obviously depend on the projects but it's things like um, participants will be working with researchers to develop or update research tools or materials um, they might be part of a steering group to try and sort of direct the project and shape it um, it could be sharing experiences or specific knowledge which will really help improve the project and its outcomes. Thank you. So could you just tell us a bit about how it has influenced, for example, the clock study? So the clock study, um, their, the very first online PPI meeting we had was less than a year ago. So it was June 21. And in that time, they've already accomplished quite a lot of significant things, I would say. So the first thing really is that they helped to advise on the research definition that Terence was speaking about earlier of long COVID in children and young people. And that didn't exist before. So they were kind of instrumental in, in getting that defined. Um, they've been sharing with us the best ways to really try and keep other young people engaged in the study, because um, that can be quite a, a tricky thing to do. Um, they've been advising us on how we should be sharing the information not just with the young people who are taking part in the clock study, but other young people who might not be taking part and just the public generally, really. Um, and that included one of our participants had the very fantastic idea of um, having assemblies and workshops in school for school aged young people to kind of get the word out there. And we've also had one of the participants design the artwork that you might have seen at the start of Terence's slides. Um, and so that's sort of the specifics, but on the whole, what something we tried to do was really make sure that we had a group of participants who were as representative as we could get of the many thousands of young people taking part in the clock study. Because what we really are aiming for is that this research is shaped by people who've got a mix of experiences and backgrounds from all over the country, rather than a group of young people who might have very similar experiences or backgrounds or who just come from one or two areas of the country. Oh, thank you very much. And I guess we'd like to think that re our research will make a difference. Could you share how you think that the research will make a difference? Yeah, I think there's probably kind of three big areas for me, um, generally speaking. And I think the first one is just the sheer numbers of young people taking part in this study. It's such a significant amount, you know, and it's so many more than we thought that we would recruit at the beginning um, and into the tens of thousands and I think that 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 just gives a better breadth and depth of understanding of really what's going on for young people both with and without long COVID as well I think it's it's going to really help paint a quite detailed picture um, I think another thing is that we're asking young people to share their own experiences so we're not asking parents or carers or professionals, we're asking the young people themselves. And I think that's really, really important to have 
that first person experience. And I think lastly, now that we've got this kind of working definition of long COVID, the research definition that you know took a lot of work to get to and involve lots of different people, um, it's hopefully gonna mean that globally now there is a shared understanding of what long COVID in young people is um, and that that means hopefully that the quality of research will improve. Brilliant, thank you. And I guess, Emma, you sort of like a bridge, aren't you, in, in a way? So sitting sort of part of the, the research team, a co-applicant on the study, but also in some ways the conduit um, for young people's voices to be heard and, and facilitating all that. What are some of the challenges involved? I was saying working with us, but what are some <laughs> of the challenges that might be involved in doing some of this PPI work or working with us if you, if you want to go there? I think that, you know, the biggest challenge really for any study that that has PPI in it and effectively in it is trying to make sure that that PPI group is representative of the people taking part in the study but then when you think about the, the size and the scale of CLOCK um, and it's the whole country and it's tens of thousands of young people you know that it takes an awful lot of thought and planning to really try and get that right and then when you think that because of, because of COVID, because it's a pandemic, because it's novel, all of the, the funding and the calls for research were urgent. So on top of that, which was already quite tricky, we then had the extra issue of trying to get this going at speed. So, you know, we had to do something that takes a lot of planning and thought as carefully as we could, but, you know, urgently. So that that was a challenge. But I think we, we got there. Um, and I think, you know, the pandemic as a whole, because of that, you know, we started off as an online project. And so the whole thing will continue to be online. And from a PPI point of view, sometimes that can be helpful. So we can have a much more diverse group because people can attend meetings from their home rather than having to come to the site. Um, but the, uh, the flip side of that is, um, you know, we've had to think of some new ways, some better ways of capturing information, of making the sessions as inclusive as we can. Um, chat box has been really good for that actually. Um, we decided to, you know, we'd need to make worksheets because with young people, not everybody can attend every session every time. You know, we don't expect that, but we still really wanted to capture people's perspectives and experiences. So, yeah, we've had to do some kind of novel creating of things. And for me personally, I've always been used to running PPI sessions in person. So it's quite strange sometimes to not see people's faces or, you know, rarely hear their voices. Um, and that can make it more difficult too. So in, in a room, I might notice if somebody looks like they really want to say something, but they can't find a gap or they might disagree with a point, but don't. that's much more difficult to pick up online than in person. And I just think, you know, lastly, the sort of final thing I say is that it, two years doesn't sound very long for a project and some projects go on for, you know, five years longer, but actually with, with an age, with young people, life can move and change very, very quickly um, and at short notice and quite often, you know, things happen that you didn't predict. And so keeping people engaged for the whole of that time um, is going to be quite a challenge, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you um, for, for presenting, for sharing your experiences and also for all the work that you do. Um, for, for the different research projects. Thank you. Right, so we've got to the last 10 minutes. If people have some questions, um, then uh, we can, it would be great. Um, perhaps Terence Stevenson could put his camera on and Shemez as well. That would be great. And uh, we've got a question in the chat, in, in the Q&A. Um, so, this, a very big study is fantastic, it includes a wide range of different people, so that applies to skids and clock. Um, but are there plans for either study to look at some of the differences between the different subgroups, for example, the more severe or the less severe? Terence. Uh, yes, so we are planning to look, for example, we've got a separate subgroup of 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, there are some big studies of adults particularly going from 20 years up. And our original research was 18 years down. So there's a group in the middle who missed out. So we're, we're going to look at them. Uh, we are also 
as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at young people who caught the Omicron variant and comparing that, that 2020, January 2022 group to young people who were infected in 20 and 21. We have got funding from a charity to, for, to have a PhD student, uh, who Fiona's not on the call, but Fiona's going to be talking to some people, perhaps more severe people, visiting them in their home, trying to get a bit more detail about how uh, COVID has affected them and whether it's affected other family members and their parents as well. And we've got another group of young people where both a, a parent and a young person has been affected with persisting symptoms. So yes, lots of plans to look at lots of different, in more detail, at different groups of, of young people. Thank you. Shmez, do you want to say about the SCID study? Um, so yes, again, very similarly. I think we've just gone... Um, We've, we've done a lot of studies that are taking part, but we're sort of reaching a point now where um, we're not really sure where to go in, in which direction, because, you know, almost all kids in the UK have now had the infection once uh, and testing all the time doesn't really add much information. What we don't want to do is just keep testing for the sake of testing. So there is a move away from doing this large scale, big studies, um, that uh, are just giving numbers that keep changing over time. What we are focusing a lot more is looking at the immunity in children. So we have a few smaller studies, uh, like little offshoots of skid studies, where we're doing really complicated immunology on them to try and understand how they respond to the different viruses, whether responding to one virus changes, how they respond to another virus how the vaccine plays a role to see if their immunity changes, the benefits of vaccinating children who've already been infected. It's that type of work that we're doing, which is really a lot of complex laboratory immunology work, which doesn't need a lot of children, but it does need following up those children over, over a few months. So that's the direction we're taking our studies in schools. Thank you. And maybe the final question to end to each of you, and we can uh, start with Emma. Emma, what do you think is the most important question to answer for uh, research into long COVID in children and young people? From your perspective, from someone who's been speaking to children with lived experience and other family members, what would you say was the most important question for research to address? In true PPI style, I would say that the only way to find out what is most important is to ask the young people themselves. Okay, thank you. Shemez. I'm going to cheat away from skids into Terence's to give him a harder chance so he can't say what I did. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, I think that, I think we are failing long COVID because it, it is, Become a, it's become a name that is it's become so divisive because we it's been so inclusive, it makes it difficult for parents. It makes it difficult for clinicians, and we don't know which direction to go with. We open up long COVID clinics, yet we don't really know who's entering them or what's happening with them. Uh, I think the big unmet need is we we have a feel for the really sick kids who have long COVID as we understand it, who genuinely need a multidisciplinary approach to management. It's a tiny proportion with very big problems. And we need to try and find those kids so we can support them. And they're all hidden inside this big cloud of long COVID. And I wish we have better tools to identify those kids so we can support them and their families through a very difficult time. So I think that is the biggest unmet need that I see. Thank you. When you say multidisciplinary, you mean, what, what sort means, of, what, what do you mean by that? It's just supporting them with the problems that they tell us if they are fatigued then they need a, 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 a management plan for the fatigue if they have respiratory problems and they're breathless they need respiratory input if they need physio then that's what you help them when if there's psychological motivation to get them out of it then that's how you help them so it's um it, it really it, it it depends on what it is as as Emma said, it's to do with um, the lived experience. It is their experience that we have to try and support, but we need to find them first so that we can provide that support. And I think that's going to be very, very challenging because it's genuinely have, being on the field and being out on the front line, it is not common. 
But when it occurs, the families are completely crippled by it and they need support. We just have to do better to find them. Thank you. Terence. Well, my answer builds a little on Shemaz. It's, uh, I think for us as researchers, the most important thing is to identify how rare or how common that is. Shemaz is absolutely right. We, we'd like to identify how many young people are left with really disabling symptoms, be they mental health problems or physical problems. What are those problems? Are they principally tiredness or persisting cough or dizziness? Or is it all loss of smell and taste, which gradually come? So I think pinning down the numbers of young people who have really persisting problems and the severity of those, what's the major things that are really dis troubling them and disturbing them, I think that would be a thing that we could we could contribute. I think that's that's what we'll try and do. It's very important. Great. Thank you very much. So it's coming up to the hour. So I just want to thank everybody who's given up uh, their evening to come and attend the webinar, to ask the questions, to our panelists, and of course, to all the people who are taking part in the research and really helping us answer some questions. So thank you everybody. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. And thanks Ross for guiding us through it. Take care.